So this is a little bit different in that rather than speaking to a particular technology or a product, I wanted to take the opportunity of the J. Ross community to raise a question that's becoming sort of more and more prominent in my mind, which is as we move to open access for content, but even as we think about open data and tool usage and the like, what is the ultimate product? And you sort of are gonna guess some of the um, echoing of some quotes that are kind of coming into my mind. But particularly what has motivated me here is the fact that we know that commercial publishing platforms, paywalled or, un or open, are already doing an immense amount of reader tracking on behavior. We see articles like we saw this week from Overdrive saying, here's what people are reading during the pandemic. Um, and Overdrive, of course, a, a provider to publishers. When we look at library institutional repositories, we see that there is a great deal of tracking of usage of content, no doubt for good reasons, um, to want to know what is being used, how it is being used and the like. Increasingly, we see transformative agreements and peer publish agreements where libraries are asking for data about what is happening to the articles that they publish or that they financially support the publication of. And we see this also happening with grant funders. We see the development of some sort of equivalent to the counter reports for open access usage, um, led right now by PLOS and LibLinks. So all of this is pushing us towards greater and greater tracking of readers. But as a librarian, of course, this sets off my spidey sense because for many years, libraries have held this sort of general statement, which is that free people read freely and that we need to be able to inquire and follow our interests without being tracked in order to really have the kind of intellectual freedom. So I'll just, for those people who are not trained as librarians, a small travel through some of our background as our professional ethics and the kinds of things that I'm wondering about, including we'll see that these documents sort of assume that the library is the uh, funding agent for reader access. But in reality with open access, of course, um, there is no librarian funding access for the reader, it's funding publishing for the author. So we have the Library Bill of Rights, which says that when people are using a library, they should have access, they should have privacy in pursuing the things that are of interest to them. And particularly we have this, which is that all people, regardless of origin, age, background, or views, possess a right to privacy and confidentiality in their library use. Libraries should advocate for, educate about, and protect people's privacy safeguarding all library use data, including personally identifiable information. Now, again, this I was already talking here about library materials, but when the library is moving into the, the role of being publisher, what happens to reader privacy? Now, this is really important because long standing is that we know that surveillance changes people's behavior. Now, in some ways, some people might think great because of course we want people to behave well, but at the same time, we don't want them to have their intellectual freedom impinged upon. And we know that when users recognize or fear that their privacy or confidentiality is compromised, the true freedom of inquiry no longer exists. And we as librarians believe, and I think others do as well, that privacy is essential to the exercise of free speech, free thought, and free association values that we hold dear to us in our current society as well as in past. And as librarians, we also have a code of ethics that says that we are obligated to provide the highest level of service that we can, but that in doing so, we need to protect each library's user's right to privacy and confidentiality. So the Bill of Rights is the rights that a reader has, the code of ethics are the obligations of the librarian. So we have many, many policy documents within the American Library Association um, that start to define for us, for example, what user privacy is, which is the right of open inquiry without having the subject of interest examined or scrutinized by others. And then confidentiality in this particular context is the work that libraries do in order to protect that right of privacy. It is everyone's responsibility within the library to ensure the data is being protected and not shared more openly than we intend. 
So regardless of the technology used, everyone in the library who collects or accesses personally identifiable information in any format has a legal and ethical obligation to protect confidentiality. So again, this all assumes that the library is paying for access for the reader, but we can still say we are setting up these systems and I think our ethical obligations have to continue. Within the American Library Association, there's also been some additional work to create privacy guidelines for vendors, those third parties that provide services to libraries. Again, though, most of this is still assuming the library is contracting for the service as well, instead of necessarily either being the publisher or contracting for publication services. So as I've been thinking about this and becoming sort of increasingly wondering what is going to happen to reader privacy within the open access environment, here are some of the things that have really been coming to my mind. The Quip data is the new oil. And if you aren't the customer, you're the product. So are we turning our readers into products? And who is the customer in open access? It is the author who wants to know what's being read is it the person who is paying for the publication or the entity? The other thing I think we really have to understand is that free reading does not equal free services. I've, um, you know, the reality is that you might have access to the independent article that is open access, or for example, on the Science Direct platform, in order to download the, all of the open access articles in a particular issue of an open access journal, you must create an account. You can download one article at a time without an account, but you have to have an account in order to download more than one at a time. Now, we might think that this is a case where Elsevier is, you know, our, <laughs> one of our, the, the bad boys, except what I will tell you is they're actually the only one who provides that service that I can find where you can actually download more than one article at a time. So it's an interesting question of when we start to trade data for services. The other thing, of course, that publishers are challenged by is that open access publishing is primarily episodic. It's based on the publication as opposed to ongoing revenue. And so it raises question in my mind is whether we'll start to see monetizing of user data or even what we sometimes hear being called the data exhaust that comes out of a system. This is really a question for us about what future do we want with our, open, with our protections for readers and the privacy that they have. And are we satisfied with the direction of travel? What I'm seeing in many cases is that we're going to greater and greater reader surveillance. And I'm not entirely com comfortable with that personally as a librarian. I'm not personally comfortable with it as a reader. And I'm not sure that this is the future that we want to create. So this was really meant not to pitch a particular way, but to raise these questions and invite comments as we you know, grapple with these issues across the entire sector of the kind of tools that we're talking about at this conference and many others like it. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It feels really heavy for the last session of a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's good. It's a good, good note to end on, in my opinion. Um, so come on, people, give us um, uh, give us some questions. Um, oh, here's one. Uh, Danielle asks, how do you see the tension between radical openness and privacy play out in your world? I, I think this is a great question, right? This is the question because the more, th I mean, we even heard this in the keynote tonight, right? With the COVID data. Um, in order to make this open, you compromise people's privacy potentially. And so great care had to be taken to de-identify and to put a lot of protections around that data. Um, that's a case where there's been a lot of attention to that issue. I'm kind of worried about cases where radical open is not nearly so thoughtfully pursued. But the reality is radical open might even, you know, you know it, it, other people can monetize your data um in an open system right and so that's mm -hmm. an interesting interesting question right um ashley uh how is this type of surveillance different from the subscription model to an open one not sure i read that with the right inflection um 
So I think that the difference is that within the context of libraries contracting for reading access, libraries have historically, um, we, we require a number of things when we contract for subscription services, one of which is some sort of data protections. Now, I will say that I don't think libraries have been as good at these data protections in uh, third party platforms as we have been in the print world. Um, NISO um, convened, you know, a number of years ago, and we wrote the NISO privacy principles. There's been work within ALA with a vendor checklist. I currently have a grant from the Mellon Foundation to look at improving our license language around privacy. The Seamless Access Working Group has um, a group on contract language. But in all those cases, that's when the library has a contract for reading. Um, we also, by the way, also contract for preservation and accessibility for people with disabilities. So privacy is not the only thing that sort of comes to mind, but I wanted to bring that focus here today. But I think we could have the same questions around some of these other issues as well. So the difference is where our leverage points are. Um, certainly individual faculty members or researchers paying APCs are not going to withhold their manuscript and say, that they have to have some sort of read privacy protections around it, including that they potentially would like to have some of that data so they can say, oh, look, people at X, Y, and Z important universities are reading my work. Um, this is the kind of thing that ResearchGate and academia.edu tells a scholar about their work. Um, and libraries, as they contract for pure publish, like with PLOS, you see that increasingly libraries are demanding some data back. So it's a, it's a weird flip from protecting reader privacy absolutely to actually wanting to have the data come back to the library in order to justify the, um, the investment in publishing an open access article or a set of articles from your institution through say PLOS or even any number of the hybrid publishers. So I think we can see why this data is desired Right, you want to know that it has an impact, et cetera. But what does it do to the overall reader experience? I think is one we need to ask ourselves and attend to. Uh, Tim's related question is whether uh, restricting um, this kind of data exhaust cuts off uh, vital source of revenue for open systems. It might. Christine, uh, Lisa, do you think usage data can be shared similarly to what was figured out for clinical trial patient data management in, in 3C? Yes, I absolutely think that there could definitely be, and I mean, the, um, if it's the Christina I'm thinking, <laughs> I can't see it right now, but Drummond. I think the open book um, data analytic, the, the o OA book data trust is a good example of a group that's at least looking that when that data is collected together, it's de-identified. Um, but all this data gets collected, identified before it's de-identified. And so we still have to recognize that we're surveilling people and it's the act of surveillance that potentially impedes the kind of freedom that we're concerned about, not what happens with the data eventually. So one could argue though for transparency and disclosure as at least a better um, frame and a transparency and disclosure around how the data will be used. But the fact that it's tracked at all is already creating that situation. Uh, Daniel Robinson would love to see a list of, uh, a list to follow the library groups who are working on privacy. I can um, perhaps put that in the, the Slack later of the, some of the groups that are working on this. Great. Uh, Devin Savage uh, says, uh, asks, are you equally concerned about the surveillance of production as the preservation of free reading? Or does one rise above the other, other in importance of priority? That sounds like a happy hour, late night drink. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think there's an obvious, um, you know, I don't think we're going to like make a three point checklist um, so much as to have to be really clear on when we're making the decisions that we are, but then even when you do make decisions to collect or not collect, what should be disclosed to the reader? Um, what kind of agency should the reader have in this environment? And, you know, kind of echoing a little bit of GDPR, for example, we, you know, is there differentials where you can say like, yes, you can collect this about me, but no, not that. Um, but, you know, 
we know from GD that GDPR is no way is an absolute protection for reader privacy. Mm -hmm. um, just to be clear, I'm not claiming that there are no concerns around paywalled content. So this isn't something that's unique to open access. It's just that the levers and the policies and the drivers are different. And so we can't, we don't have the same contractual strategies that we might have with, with, uh, pay, with paywalled content. Right. Um, I'll also note that there's a, a big um, kind of convergence of these concerns within uh, ed tech um, um, platforms and systems uh, within the university as well. And, and uh, exactly uh, what the utility of, of data, and what, but what kind of protections um, uh, can be put in there. Absolutely. I was actually just talking today with Kyle Jones. He and I have a an IMLS grant around privacy and learning analytics where libraries are participating. And we have been talking a lot about Proctorio and some of the other uh, proctoring services and said, okay, at the moment that data is actually out of scope for our project because institutions aren't putting it into learning analytics streams. But mm -hmm. what if they would just start putting that data into learning analytics streams then our then our curriculum for our grant that we're developing has to get a lot more complicated. Um, so we uh, we're kind of hoping it doesn't come into those learning analytics streams, but one can imagine the temptation that institutions and commercial providers and uh, you know other organizations might have in order to push it in that way, including credentialing like you know LSAT or uh, various uh, exams. This project, this topic can get like, I'm, I was trying to make it small and it just kind of continues. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the work. Um, it's super, super important.